This program is made possible through support from Savannah Canoe and Kayak, pedal sports outfitter for the Georgia coast. Savannah Canoe and Kayak provides top quality instructions, guided tours, and camping adventures to the barrier islands of the Georgia coast. The Original Pancake House, a gourmet breakfast and lunch served with a friendly smile, where quality fresh and made from scratch still rule. Green Truck Pub, Savannah's grass-fed burger joint featuring coastal area farmers and American craft breweries. And Brighter Day, Savannah's only independent historic natural food market featuring made-from-scratch deli, vitamins and supplements, and a juice bar. Brighter Day is not a chain, but a link to the community. Thanks for watching Art Talks, Art Matters. I am your host, Jerome Meadows, founder and director of Indigo Sky Community Gallery here in Savannah, Georgia. Our program is about the importance of art in our lives and how it enriches us in countless ways. I'll be speaking with a wide array of Savannah artists, curators, gallery directors, and others creative individuals involved in this broad and dynamic field. Our guests will present their own work and that of others they've chosen to showcase. I urge you to seek out these individuals and organizations along with our sponsors and to support them as best you can. Our guests on today's show are Christopher Monroe and Shay Hunt. Uh, Christopher is an arts contributor for the Savannah Morning News. As a writer, he has over 15 years of experience covering the arts and culture. He's written for various regional, national, and international publications, including The Village Voice, Playboy Magazine, and The Atlantic Monthly. Chris's showcase artist today is local Savannah sculptor James Kendall. Welcome to Chris. Thank you, Our other guest is Shay Slimmer. Uh, she is an artist who lives and works in downtown Savannah, and her medium of choice is oil on canvas. Shay's paintings can be seen by appointment, as well as an upcoming solo pop-up exhibition of her work on Friday, April 29th, at 409 East Bay Street, opening reception at 7 to 9 p.m. Shay's showcase artist for this episode is Maggie Hayes, who was born and raised in Savannah. Okay, so let's get things underway. Okay. Right, we're going to start talking about you or to you about you. Um, I just to give a little lead in. I understand that you um, started painting as a child. How old? Um, so, you know, I can't really remember. Okay. But uh, I've I've always uh, scribbled on the walls. Ah. <laughs> Do your parents still like? Uh, yeah. <laughs> But it was uh, in your 20s, I understand, that you got into oil painting, and that's been your medium of choice. Yeah, ever, uh, I just couldn't get away from it. Um, I've obviously tried other mediums, watercolor and uh, acrylics, and um, even a little bit of sculpture. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, oils are really uh, the thing that I keep going back to, and uh, now I, I don't think I could really paint with anything else. It's really? my favorite. And what is about it that is so appealing for you? Well, I think it's the, the pureness of the pigment and that you have uh, such control over uh, the different mediums you can use to manipulate it. And so um, you can get a very saturated effect or you can get a thinned out effect, I think, and it's different than when you're thinning with water mm -hmm. or water-based uh, mediums. And oil takes a long time to dry, I mean, is that it works in your favor or how do you contend with it? It certainly works in my favor in most instances. Um, sometimes, you know, I've got a fan on my painting trying to get it to dry a little bit faster, but most times I enjoy that it uh, 
gives me a little bit more leeway with how much time I have. Okay. And um, I understand that your uh, approach is rather scientific, more calculated approach to painting. Maybe it was a little bit of an idea. I feel like it is a bit scientific, I, mm -hmm. and, and that um, the calculated side of it is um, simply from drawing on my color theory background. And so I'm uh, very particular about um, minute changes in the color and how it interacts with each other. And so. The scientific part comes um, where I'm using color theory and then I'll place one color next to another color and then that interaction tells me what the next color will be. Okay. So it's, uh, it's a bit of a process that I'm going through to create these paintings. And what size do you want to work in? So large, large scale works uh, are what I work in. Um, I've tried smaller pieces but I can't seem to um, get the same effect that I can with the larger canvases. Mm -hmm. um, and so most of the time, I like it literally to be the same size as me, maybe a no, little bit larger. Um, I'm, I'm literally interacting with a painting that is slightly larger than me. Um, so I can walk into it and out of it, and into it and out of it. Very interesting. OK, so what, what dimensions would that come on entail? So um, six foot paintings are ideal for me. Okay. Um, uh, so I go anywhere from four foot, four feet to, to seven feet, okay. um, and, and that's the range that I, I seem most comfortable with. Okay. Um, and so these are the uh, paintings that are on um, painting stands or on the floor, or how? Oh, uh, if I work on easels or not? Uh -huh. uh, yes. Mostly just old paint buckets, uh, uh, propped okay. against walls. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, if I put them up too high, it'd be hard to reach the top. So then I have to bring in a step ladder. So and you'd rather not do that. I, I try to just put them on buckets. Excellent, excellent. Um, and, and you made a statement that uh, sometimes you purposely make your work a little irritating. Is, is that uh, you're I know, that's, on that? Or? It seems like it might be a derogatory term, but I don't. I say irritating. It may not be the right term for that. But okay. what I, I want to say is, it's there's tension okay. and there's a complication okay. that. Uh, hopefully, I think may grabs you, yes. grabs your attention, okay. and then holds it, Excellent. and to where you look a little further, looking for the problem that caught you in the first place. Okay, so you want people and to be engaged. I want them to be engaged, yeah. but I don't want them to actually find the problem. It's a hidden secret. So there's a mystery. There's a mystery, and um, when there's something is not quite right, like a painting is on the wall and you walk by and it's slightly crooked. Your instinct is to, you can't help but look at it. You want to straighten it. Well, that's an easy fix. You can go straighten it. With mine, I hope that fix is not so easy for you to find. Interesting. To hold your attention. OK, well, with that said, let's, uh, let's start talking about some of these paintings. OK. okay. Um, so this one, if you put this in the time frame, is this recent? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, uh, what you'll be seeing now are all recent works, but this one is not super recent in that it's a, a year old. OK. Um, this is a um, seven foot painting, four feet by seven feet. And it is um, probably a breakthrough piece for me. Oh. Um, it, I, I have always been painting with these square brush strokes. I use a large, a flat brush okay. for all of my work, and I have layered colors for quite some time. Mm -hmm. So with this, you start to see that the paint is not necessarily bleeding together on the canvas as much, in that I'm letting layers below dry. OK, so each color application is a distinctly separate, identifiable thing. Almost at this point. Almost, so, okay. so as we, we move forward with the paintings, you'll you'll see sometimes there's more of a soft quality where they bleed together, mm -hmm. and then this is starting to show regions where there's these flat places for your eye to rest, rather than all blending together on being softer. Okay, excellent, mm -hmm. excellent. And well, let's go back to that real quick. Does that one have a title that you can share? Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> But I didn't bring my notes. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. All right, the next one. Uh, so this one is um, a very new piece. And this is uh, something that you can kind of see happening here where it's almost fragmenting. Hmm. But the fragments are created by the layers underneath. So the smaller lines that are formed, which give it that movement, 
are actually larger fields of color that have been covered up. Oh, okay. So the no small brush was used. Right, right, right. So it's always the same brush away. Correct. And so the the way that the layers of color cover each other up creates smaller little fragments I see, yeah. looking into the layers beneath. Interesting. So you're creating movement around the canvas, but then also through the canvas. Yeah. Well, Chris, what, what, what's your response to, uh, to these arts? I know you said that you're a fan of Shea. I, I am, I am. Um, I guess my first, uh, I was just wondering if, if it, how this is developed. You said that it, these aren't bleeding, the, the colors aren't bleeding as much. Did, that, did you do that? a little more earlier on and it's developed or no? Yes, my earlier work was um, much softer in that I, instead of doing all of the mixing on the palette, I was doing much of the mixing on the canvas while the paint was wet. So this technique um, is actually going a step further and doing the softer underneath underlayment of color and then coming on top after the paint has dried and bringing in new layers of color. Well, the other thing I find striking is um, the, 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 the similarity, and that, that comes by way of your process, your technique. But this is very different from the previous one. Um, the format is more of a square here. Um, and the previous one had this uh, darker bottom, uh, which sort of grounded the painting. This, this one feels, by contrast, more um, elevated, I think. Um, is that a a conscious decision on your part that some would have that grounding, others would not? I, I usually go into them with the thought that they're going to be grounded. Okay. Um, I, I prefer uh, a triangle sitting this way rather than up inverted. That <laughs> makes me feel more comfortable when things are grounded. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes the composition, as I move through the painting, the composition changes. And so when that happens, I try to allow it to do that. And, um, and that's why when you see darker areas in other parts of the painting, it's because compositionally it told me to do that. Oh, and I followed what the painting was, the direction was going. So you have a pretty scientific approach, but you allow for the painting to organically... I try to things. still be an artist and not a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. OK, well, let's see the next one. And here we are with the grounded bottom again. Sure. OK, so this is also one that was done about a year to a year and a half ago. And, um, and you can see the, the almost horizon line that's happening. Mm -hmm. Almost a horizon and maybe some trees and little animals and things happening. And there's images. Oh, in the <laughs> so there's, there's elements in there, little surprises and things that um, you kind of have to look for which I think is what's part of the joy about this work is that, you know, it's the first thing you see is an abstract painting, but then if you look a little further, you're going to see more. You don't see the animals. I'm starting <laughs> to see them now. I'm starting to see them. It's a Jedi yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what, uh, what do you see if not animals? Is there some, some way that you could verbalize with your eyes? Well, I like to, I mean, I guess I'm, I, I guess I'm maybe a little more drawn to the ones that do have kind of a horizon type thing going on. I don't know, I like darker colors, maybe just an aesthetic point of view. But I don't know, I, I think there maybe there is something kind of subliminal going on that, that grounds and it gives me, a, like I guess, a point of reference or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I like these all watch. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next one. I, I'm, uh, I like this piece, and I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> I like the movement in this one. I was going to say it spins. Mm -hmm, but there's a there's almost a, a dark portal in the center, mm. and um, it's not really in my nature to put um, such a, an intense eye grabbing feature right in the center of a painting mm. like that. I usually have it all centered, but for some reason it worked with this, and I think it's because um, the way the color is moving around the canvas, it keeps your eye going around rather than floating off the canvas and going somewhere else. Well, did, did that um, portals come in the beginning or as you were developing? Much later, as uh -huh. I was developing. Mm -hmm. um, so this, this um, uh, is a good segue, I think, to in, in our conversation, you were talking about uh, the therapeutic value of, of what you do as a painter. Um, could you give us a little bit of 
insight into that? Yes. Um, so when I go into the studio and I paint, um, I'm not really looking for an end result for any of the paintings. I don't have a, um, anything in mind, and I'm not looking at a particular photograph as reference. Um, for me, it's all about the color mixing and then um, creating problems on canvas to solve. Okay. So what I mean by that is I'll uh, create a color field, and then I'll purposely put an irritating color next to it. And then bring in <laughs> another, yeah, it, it really can be at times. Um, is they bring in another color and that harmonizes suddenly the other two colors that weren't interacting well together. Mm -hmm. And then I'll purposely bring in another color and that creates discord again. Okay. And then I do this process over and over again. And so each color that goes down uh, tells me which color to do next. There's, uh, I have no preconceived idea of what the end result will be. I see. Um, so you don't sketch these out in any way? There's no sketching. There's n nothing like that. The sketching actually happens on my palette when mixing color. Uh -huh. So uh, that's where all of, uh, everything happens. Every formula, every idea, it's all happening with the color. And so um, through this process of creating a problem and solving it, I'm able to subconsciously almost meditate and problems that I have in everyday life suddenly disappear because my mind has worked them out while I'm working this out. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. So you would recommend that as a form of stress relief? I highly recommend it. So grab a paintbrush. Grab a paintbrush. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, I think we have another. Yes. So here you see the dark uh, yeah, darkness on the top. Well, I flipped it over. <laughs> <laughs> Good, so, so you, you rotate these paintings? So I rotate the paintings. Okay. Um, I rotate them quite often at the end of the, uh, my 20 layers of paint. <laughs> you know, the, the last five sittings, I rotate them because sometimes, well, I think a successful painting can be turned. And I think that if you are stuck on something, you should look at it from a different perspective. Huh. So you should either turn it or you should look at it through a mirror or you should change the way that you see it. And so I think it's very helpful. And once in a while, it's actually more successful the other way around. Really? And so I don't, I, I work with that and then I'll finish the painting with it in a, a different orientation. And if it works, then, I, then it's done, you know? So do most of them end up in a different orientation than nope. you have been working on them? Most of them end up in their original orientation. Okay. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this works for abstract. If you were doing a portrait of someone and you turned it upside down. <laughs> Although, if you're working on a portrait <laughs> and you get stuck, flip it upside down and see that you don't see your problems, I mean, or mistakes or whatever is bothering okay. you. It's very interesting how looking at it from a different perspective will suddenly something becomes obvious that wasn't obvious before. Interesting. And it's very fascinating. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Can I ask a quick cool question? Sure. Okay. I'm, I'm curious when you say that when you're solving these problems, are you doing it intellectually or are you doing it more intuitively? So do you mean solving problems uh, with, with color? With color, yeah. Um, I'm doing it through uh, experience and knowledge of color theory. So um, the way that I see color, uh, whether it interacts with the, in a, in a nice way or not a nice way. Yeah. I mean, those are the problems that I'm solving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And sometimes purposely, I want two colors that don't quite play nice together to be next to each other so that your eye will be drawn to it. Tension, yeah. mm -hmm. Tension. Excellent, well, very good. That's, that's uh, quite fascinating. Um, rotating your painting to see <laughs> what it needs. I think that could work with anything in life if you're, if you're not <laughs> seeing it quite right and you need a different perspective, turn just it turn it down. around. <laughs> okay, well that's great. We're going to have to move on to your showcase on this. Okay. Um, Maggie Hayes. So give us a little bit of context. So this is Maggie and uh, she is very much uh, the Renaissance woman in that she sculpts and paints and writes and uh, does lots of things and is very creative. Um, and I met her, her locally here in Savannah. This is where she's from. And um, yeah, I was just drawn to her work. So this is her. And um, I brought in a few pieces to show. Okay. Um, what is it about her work that you specifically, she does painting and sculpture? Or she does. Um, she's very expressive. And I, I enjoy her line work. I enjoy her expressive. Uh, painterly style, mm -hmm. and um, 
And I think that she has the self-confidence that it takes to be a successful artist. Okay, so she's young. She is young. Mm -hmm. Very good. Getting started. Getting started. Okay, well let's uh, look at some of her work and we can go into it. Um, we can go to uh, image number three. I mean, it grabs you, doesn't it? It does, <laughs> right off the bat. Right off the bat. Um, what does it grab you? How do you, how do you feel as a result of being grabbed by it? What's the uh, impact? Well, I, I think that this painting uh, is one of her works that pulls you right in and makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable. Yes. Um, yeah. So, but not necessarily in uh, taking you to a dark place. Um, but, you know, I, I like work that can grab you right away and then hold your attention for a minute and make you think about it. So that's, that's why I like this piece. And I, and I think that the, also like the technique behind it, you know, I like the solid fields mixed with these painterly strokes through the middle and, and it becomes more than just a portrait of a man to me. Yes. Chris? I mean, I, I don't know. I, 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 it's, it raises questions. I guess that's a little, yeah, that's that's an interesting that's yeah. thing that comes to me. Like, what's going on? Why is he? What, what's he doing? It, it's really, interesting because those questions for me, um, I'm a, I'm, they, they have to be intentional. Um, and for me, they largely stem from an uncertainty about his eyes. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure what the eyes are doing, and, and you sort of go to the eyes to get get a sense of. Uh, you know, what, um, why is he in this condition? Um, but yeah, it's very uh, visually engaging and, and uh, perhaps a bit um, troubling, uh, but such is the nature of art. <laughs> and this is just part of her portfolio. Let's see what else she has. This is a striking piece. Yes, it is. Um, in, in that it's a single figure in the middle of uh, what is a boxing ring. Um, and the color palette is uh, all neutral except for this shadow, which is this orange engaging color, yet the figure is slumped over. And it's, it, it almost makes you feel alone and a little bit voyeuristic because of the angle that we're viewing it yeah, at. We're looking you, in, you're on, looking this in on this solo moment. Yeah. Um, and, and it looks like something just happened or is about to happen, and so there's some tension there. And I also uh, really enjoy the way she's used the entire campus, the bleeding off the edges. Um, the, so the composition is what originally drew me to it, but then also you get into, oh, there's a story here. Mm -hmm. um, well, there's this intensity of, um, I mean, the framing of the painting itself is somewhat squarish, mm -hmm. and the ring is a square, but there, the, off angle of it is, uh, mm -hmm. is very psychologically dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was a discussion as to whether or not that's a male or female figure. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's intriguing that uh, it's left to one's own um, determination. Did you want to say anything about that? I mean, I think I said this earlier, but it, it's very kind of cinematic, the angle of it. And I, I just like the dark corners because it, it kind of does give a feeling of kind of isolation. Mm -hmm bringing that to, to it myself, but I, 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 I like the that. Isolation. Yeah, I mean, I, I like that a lot of it. And, you know, it was funny, because I saw this, this piece when it was on exhibition, and one of the things that I pointed out to Maggie was, um, in spite of everything we've been talking about, there's this color thing going on on the forward-facing ring post. Mm -hmm. On one level, I'm, I'm like, what is that? Why is it there? And at the same that. time, it just seems to really need to be there. It absolutely needs to be there. It helps with the perspective of the entire piece. It makes it three-dimensional. Right, but then that color thing that you have going on on the top of it. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then that mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's a, a smart use of composition. Yes, that's just it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you see male, you see male work? I don't know. I mean, I think that uh, I kind of like the ambiguity of it. I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of it. Okay, how about the uh, next one? Uh -huh. This is a portrait of a specific person. We don't necessarily need to know who, but um, it's clearly a uh, portrait. Um, it's very uh, 
fatigued. <laughs> What's your thoughts on this one, Shay? Uh, but my thoughts are that um, it looks to me like somebody that she is either knows or wants to know. Um, uh, it's a the man in repose is kind of looking in once again. He's looking the other direction, not not looking at the viewer. Um, and so, with a lot of her work, I feel like I'm uh, looking in on something, mm -hmm. or uh, you know, just kind of peeking around the corner a little bit and seeing an intimate moment. Um, and I I like how she's handled uh, all of the art on him. So there's mm -hmm. art yeah. within art here. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I'm not and I. He looks like a bruiser to me a little bit. Like, this could fall into, you know, this is part of her series she was doing with um, prize fighters and male figures. And um, and I just think that uh, this guy looks like he has uh, just got done with a fight, maybe. It, it does seem to have a psychological connection with the image we just saw mm -hmm. um, in terms of that figure, the long figure in the ring. Did you have something more? I mean, there is the kind of, I, I like the isolation of that, too. It does seem like kind of an intimate moment. And particularly with the dark background, it kind of puts in the image in kind of relief. I don't know. I like that. That cinematic quality you were yeah. talking about with her lighting and the dark backgrounds, it's, it, right. it's good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, next. So, yeah, I mentioned that she's also a, a sculptor. Yes. And some of... Uh, Sometimes she uses objects to convey things. And so this is just um, some boxing gloves, and she has actually burned words into the boxing gloves. Okay. Um, which I think are strikingly simple. Strikingly so, yeah. Yeah, and, which is why I like this piece. Um, you know, it's effective that way. You can, you can read into the, the actual words, my mother didn't read, my father didn't read, and you can have an interpretation there, or you can almost just leave it as, oh, these, these abandoned pair of gloves, who do they belong to? You know, what happened? What is the story behind these gloves? Well, the idea of uh, boxing gloves being part of um, uh, fisticuffs, you know, a competition with another person, uh, knocking someone out. Um, the idea here, one could uh, interpret, my mother didn't read, my father didn't read, um, taking up, trying to make a blow towards uh, you know, lack of education, for example. Um, and uh, yeah, so there's many ways of interpreting what this simplicity might be conveying. Absolutely. But this is part of her series dealing with um, uh, masculinity, was it? Yeah, the, uh, the title of the series was No Man's Land. Yes. And I, th I think it did touch on some gender roles. So yeah, artwork that uh, sometimes is, is comprised of found objects um, or pre-existing objects that are then um, uh, used to convey the artist's expression without a lot of manipulation of material. Mm -hmm. And then that compares with, I think, our next one, <laughs> Man in a Tub. <laughs> this man is in a tub. Uh, this is a sculpture in clay, and um, the things on his hands on either side are birds. Okay. So on his left hand, he's holding up dead birds, and on his right hand is a bird that's meant to be seen as alive. Okay. Um, so also, I was told by Maggie that, and I thought this was interesting, that this clay sculpture was never a, a permanent, known to be a permanent sculpture. There's some impermanence here. And so it was created to, therefore, afterwards, the clay would be recycled. And so this was meant as an installation, as part of an art show. And this piece was just there for that amount of time. And the material is clay? It's clay. Okay. Mm -hmm. with, with the exception of the birds? With the exception of the birds, yeah. So the birds are just a real birds that have been wired on okay. to the hand through the clay. And I mean, this is striking. I mean, this is a man alone in a bathtub uh, with some dead animals. <laughs> so it's, 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 it says a lot of different things. And without getting into her thoughts on it, you know, because I, I would hate to presume too much, but my thought is that um, I really want to know more about this oh, absolutely. piece. Um, it's very evocative. It's very evocative. And this is, um, again, this appears to be a specific person. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't come across as just a generic 
man. Um, and so that just adds to the story of, you know, who was or who is this individual as a person, um, and what do we glean from the environment that she's put, put him in, this uh, moss-covered <laughs> um, bathtub. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so between this and, and all of her other works, uh, Maggie is doing some pretty provocative work. I think so. Yeah, very good, very good. Okay, well thanks for bringing her to our attention. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now, uh, Chris, Christopher. Okay. Christopher, Christopher. <laughs> um, and again, Christopher is uh, a writer and um, has written for several prominent um, uh, publications. Um, how did you get into writing and what's your story there? Um, well, I've, I've always been a writer uh, since I was little, but I kind of just learned by doing. I didn't go to school for it. So it's something I just, you know, grew up in Atlanta. I started writing for local publications, moved to Seattle, uh, wrote for some publications there, ended up being an arts editor for a magazine there, ended up going to New York and um, kind of just uh, parlaying that into the larger publications and ended up writing for some of the you know, publications people have actually heard of. <laughs> Playboy Magazine. Playboy, uh, Atlanta, Village Voice, New York Press, stuff like that. You know. I, I learned by doing. And um, what brought you to Savannah? Um, well, <laughs> originally I was supposed to uh, be working on my novel. Don't don't ask me how that's going. <laughs> I, I worked on it. I worked on it a little bit. So you can't just to work on the novel. Pardon? You can't just Savannah to work on the novel. Uh, ostensibly, I, I I was getting away from New York. I mean, I, I, New York. I thought I was going to stay there forever, and New York is not the place that I moved there thinking it was. Uh, the the old the um, the the artist bohemia of New York is is uh, a, a mystical place now. <laughs> I don't know if it exists in reality. You mean it had its heyday? It had its heyday. It's it's a grind. I mean, it, you know, I, there's a lot of things I love about New York, but um, it's 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 hard to be a a purely creative person in New York without thinking about money, money all the time. Mm. And uh, that's that dampens the creative spirit sometimes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So um, you've, you're writing for Savannah Morning News. And I write, yeah, write for uh, mostly for Do for their weekly arts and entertainment um, inserts, mostly based on visual art. I mean, mostly covering visual arts here locally. And, and how do you approach it when you when you write? Are you considering yourself to be a critic, a reviewer? No. Or, uh, no. Don't call me. <laughs> no, I, 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 I write more. I like to think of it for a general audience, um, and I, I don't approach it from an academic standpoint, and definitely not from a. I, I'm, I'm critical in a way, but not. Um, I don't consider myself a critic, an art critic. I, I consider myself more of a creative person who likes to write about other creative people doing things, and I, that, that's kind of the way I approach it. Would that make it somewhat of a collaborative? I, I would like to think so. I mean, I, I tend to approach when I sit down with a painter or a musician or something, I kind of would like to tend to approach it on, on a more kind of an equal basis as a creative person. And hopefully that brings a, something new to the writing because I, I can hopefully try to understand where the person is coming from a little bit more than just being an academic scholar or something like that. So of um, your recent articles or, or uh, writings for Savannah Morning News, were, were there particular shows that really stood out for you? Um, I, will, I will say that um, I, I, I think this is going to air soon, so I, this the show that's up at the Jepson right now called State of the Art yes. um, is up for through September. Highly, highly recommended. Um, it's, it's, it was a show that was done for Crystal Bridges Museum in Arkansas, which is um, the brainchild of um, the, uh, Walt, Alice Walton, who was um, at the, of the uh, Walmart family. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes controversial, but they're doing really good things in that this show came out of, um, I think, many, many hundreds of, of studio visits across the country. Um, and they called together all of these artists who aren't, you know, particularly New York or LA-based artists. Um, and they're really just doing 
art for the love of it, and it's, it's a great show. So state of the art, I think, would probably be my biggest recommendation. And in, in a case like that, um, uh, are, there, are you at liberty to say that there were particular pieces that really bulged you over? Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> Vanessa, Vanessa Jones, uh, she, does, she does these, what she calls power figures, and uh, I'm actually going to do another article um, interviewing her because she's going to do a lecture and a uh, workshop here in, I believe, in late March. I need to go back and check the dates on that, but soon. Um, she does these things that are the, these power figures, and they they have they liken back to the uh, Congo um, African uh, art tradition of these power figures, where the, these nails are put in. Usually, it's these sham, shamanistic um, practice where nails are put into it. They kind of imbue the, the piece with this magic that's yeah, supposed to ward off evil and bad things. So she she does these types of figures with these found objects. And they're super powerful and super meaningful. And uh, I, I can't recommend her stuff highly enough. She actually has, I think, her first solo show coming up in Connecticut at, um, um, I can't remember the name of the gallery off the top of my head. And where does she hail from? Um, she is originally from LA, but she lives, um, she is based in um, Pittsburgh now. Okay. And she does a lot of community work too. She does a lot of stuff with, um, kids and stuff in the community. She lives in a sort of depressed area of the city. Uh, but super meaningful, super meaningful stuff. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Okay, um, and so uh, you don't want to give us any kind of information on your novel. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's an embarrassing I, subject. I, I, mean. <laughs> I really should have been finished with that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All things in their due time, huh? Yeah, of course. Um, Oh, but there is a particular article um, in, in subject that I uh, would like to discuss with you, and that's the uh, article from the uh, Atlantic Monthly dealing with Savannah's story of the uh, weeping time. Mm -hmm. Why don't you give us a little context of, of what weeping time is about? So it's, it is the one of the, if not the largest slave auction in American history. Mm. Um, it's definitely the largest documented slave auction. There may have been other larger ones, but not many. It's definitely the largest documented one. And it happened um, two and a quarter miles um, west of downtown Savannah at a, what's with the former, what used to be the Timbrock Race Course, which is now uh, just a, a lumber company. And, and there's also a, um, an elementary school on the corner of the property now. Um, and I came across it just through a walking tour of West Savannah and we came across this historical marker, uh, which was only put up in 2008, I think. I have my notes here. Um, yeah, 2008, uh, it was dedicated, uh, which was 149 years after the actual thing, but the actual auction, which was in 1859. But 436, uh, Women, children, and men were were sold, and, and it was those would have been families, and families, and it was it was from a a, a plantation, a rice plantation down in Darien, Georgia, mm -hmm. and um, I mean the story of it is is too much to go into all the detail now, but I mean it's I, I highly recommend you know, people looking it up because it's it's part of American history that just is um, it's one of these things that I I put in the article, it's one of these hidden histories which is particularly African-American history that has not been talked about, I think, enough uh, as it relates to, you know, the Antidote South and that sort of thing. Um, sure. But it's, 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 you know, and I feel like uh, Savannah is kind of full of those types of histories that haven't been fully dealt into. Sure, and without going into uh, details, the um, uh, betrayal at Ebenezer Creek, for example, mm -hmm. um, when uh, the army was marching and had a, Whole, whole bunch of uh, contraband right. on them and decided to uh, proceed without them and left these folks with no other choice. They, they made them build the bridge. They made build these, the bridge, these people yeah, build the bridge. The army went across. Right. They said, you stay over there. And then they cut the bridge and, and people died trying to swim across. It was either that or be taken back into slavery. Right. Yeah, so they, they, as you say, there was a number of stories in this area that uh, history has decided to overlook. Right, hopefully right. And hopefully articles like yours and, and things like that will bring these things to uh, what what do you what do you foresee happening with uh, weeping time? 
Um, well, I, you and I have had a little bit of discussion. I mean, I would love to see a, there's a historical marker marking the occasion, um, but it is in a kind of remote area of West Savannah that I don't know a lot of people come across it. I mean, it's great that it's there, but I, it, I would love to see a more substantial uh, monument or some sort of public art or something dedicated to that because I think that, that that history and that story, I mean that story is just incredible. I mean the, the grandfather of the person who ended up owning these slaves was the um, uh, author of the Fug Fugitive Slave Clause in the Constitution and also a signatory of the Constitution which is you know just another layer of the story. Yeah. But I think that having a monument or something that might bring more attention to it, that would be a start. <laughs> and um, how did it come by that, that name, Weeping Time? So the, so the, it, it took place over two days. Uh, it was uh, March 2nd and 3rd, 1859. Um, and, and it was said that the, during these two days of the auction, it rained and poured. And as soon as the auction was over, it was cleared up. And uh, it was said, uh, it, the, the, the name came uh, colloquially by the descendants of these slaves that said that the, the heavens were weeping along with the people that were being sold. Sure. And it came to be known as the weeping time. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, it's, it, I mean, it's a powerful story, to say the least. <laughs> so your, your range as a writer is about the arts, but it's also about sociological and historical issues as well. And that's been a, kind of a recent and that's been a, a recent branch off, but it's been, and particularly been when I've been in Savannah, there, there's, yeah. these stories have been just so um, provocative and interesting to me that I've had the opportunity, luckily, to write about them. Very good, very good. Um, so your showcase artist is James Kimball. Yes, that's James. <laughs> okay, why James, who is he, and what do we need to know? Well, first of all, James uh, James works and uh, uh, sculpts stuff right around the corner from from where I live. So I um, I can see his all of his uh, sculptures from the from my back porch. So I'll go outside and be playing frisbee with my dog and I say hi to him almost on a daily basis. So, you're so we're definitely neighbors. He doesn't live there, but he 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 lives a little bit farther away. But he's been in this area. He actually um, does a lot of body work on cars. So, um, so people in the community just kind of drive their cars up, and he, between working on these cars, he, he does these really amazing um, sculptures out of wood and uh, paper mache mostly. Well, I thought it would be an interesting uh, segue because um, one of the pieces that uh, James has done is um, a Black Holocaust memorial. Yes. Um, as we were just talking about uh, um, African American history. Yes. Legacy and, and things that need to be uh, given more acknowledgement. Um, so, tell us a little bit about this monument. That, uh, so, he did this. I mean, this is kind of the, um, I guess we say the, the cornerstone of his, his work. I bet those are my words, not his. But um, this is kind of the most visible um, sculpture that he's done. This, this Black Holocaust Memorial kind of faces the road. So, if you're driving down, um, it's uh, Broad Street. Uh, it's a corner of Broad and um, Anderson. So it, right there on the corner, if you're driving down Broad Street, you'll 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 see this piece. And he he actually did this sculpt in response to a sculpture that is a public art sculpture that was done in Savannah. Um, I don't know if we want to. Um, it's on River Street. It's on River Street. Um, that uh, that that memorializes the Middle Passage. Um, that he thought was maybe a little too, um, um, didn't, didn't show the struggle maybe as much as, as, it, as it could have. So he, he did this, this sculpt as you see with the, um, the man in chains uh, and the people uh, on the side, maybe wife and child. Mm -hmm. He, you know, he was, he, he saw this, this, this memorial go up on River Street and he thought it might, it, it might not be as, um, as honest as it could, as it could. It's forceful, right? Okay. Um, so when you say he did this, this is uh, him determining to do this on his own. Yes. Um, out of pocket expenses, I'm assuming. 
Yes, and he said, and by the, and he, what he, you know, says over and over is, this is for the kids, and this is for the community to kind of see the story and to ask questions. Um, and he encourages um, kids, you know, kids come over here and visit from the community all the time. And he kind of, he's kind of like the, you know, the, the older uncle or the, you know, the, he, he likes to kind of take people under his wing, particularly kids in the community, and kind of show them, you know, that this is. This is the history, and just just show them, you know, that things can be better, that sort of thing. But he 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 did this, as he says, for the for the kids. So I, I, there's no formal training here. No you formal know. training. What he told me was that he in he's been doing this since he was little. His his father was um, in the service, and he actually learned how to do this. Not not formally, I guess necessarily, but in when he was younger, he lived in Germany. Um, his father was stationed there. And a teacher, I guess, back then, kind of showed him the beginnings of how to do these sculpts. He's got a really great eye. And like I said, he does body work on cars, which I feel like is kind of a creative thing in a way. Um, but, but he kind of has an eye for that, like three-dimensional sculptings and stuff. Uh, this is another, yes, yeah, another piece that he's done. Just, a, just a, a conglomeration of, of, of kind of imaginative characters and stuff, really for the kids to come and kind of check out. It's, it's just rather, uh, well, very intriguing and uh, inspiring, actually. That uh, you know, someone who uh, that you don't need training in order to do this right, right. in terms of formal training. Um, that if you have uh, an idea of a need that's there for um, iconography. Right. Um, for imagery, for um, uh, creating forms that speak to your community, right. uh, and just go ahead and do it. And that's exactly what he's doing. I mean, it's very much about like he's he may have sold one or two pieces, but that's not what he does it for. He does it for the love of it. He does it for the community, really, yeah. and for the kids, and just really just to kind of express himself. And I, I feel like that's kind of one of the kind of truest motivations of a creative person is to just do it for the sake of doing it, just because you want to be doing it. Well, I'm going to ask you to come in on that comment. <laughs> sure. Well, was the dish there? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that's actually a functional piece. So. <laughs> <laughs> you get it around the dish, right. <laughs> but they are, but that actually, on that point, he does, you'll see there, there's pieces of like a, um, a table and yeah. chairs and stuff. So there are, he does a lot of the through found objects that he kind of incorporates into um, the stuff that he does. And he, I don't know, you can see a little bit on the top, there's the woodwork that he does really kind of intricate patterns on the edges and the stuff, mm -hmm. but that's that's all him. But there's, you know, you can see this, uh, there's a, like a table leg kind of sticking up at the top. But he kind of just, it's, it's kind of a mishmash of materials. And then he does these uh, mostly paper mache sculpts with kind of um, wood frames and that sort of thing around it. And do you know if this is, I, my assumption is that it's an ongoing process. It's absolutely an ongoing process. So it's not like a, a finished piece and then he goes on to something else. He just adds It keeps that. going and he actually said that he did some other pieces that, are, that were larger that he used to do kind of, not life size, but very large like giraffes and elephants um, that are based on like like sawhorses as a, as a this is like an original uh, structure, but he also there also you don't see in the picture. But there's some other older pieces that I was going to take pictures of, but he didn't want me to because they were like older and like he's like, oh, the kids have trashed that, so on. <laughs> but but they are very. This is very much an ongoing project. So this is a piece that um, neighborhood children tend to interact with. Yeah, they do, and if you can see, I don't know if you can see in, in the picture, but um, there is a there's some stairs over here on the left side, uh -huh. and you can't see it, but there's behind it there's a little slide and stuff. So it it's a functional piece that, that kids will come over, and he does he he does like a yearly um, Halloween party, and he likes kids over and has like a he's out candy and that sort of thing. So it very much is kind of a community gathering spot. Okay. And people really do come, come and go all the time, because I see them like every day. Do you want to add anything else, Shay? Oh, no, I think this is great. I, I love, um, it seems magical almost. It, it is, it really is. Um, uh, there's so, 
so much to look at. Um, but yeah, it really draws you in. And it, even the way he's handled the the way it's sitting on the ground, mm -hmm. you know, and there's so many details there. But. Well, if you see, he's kind of landscaped it too. You know, there's right. some little, uh, there's some landscaping and stuff. It's become a part of that area. You know, right. it's landscaped in it with. It's supposed to be there, yeah. and I like that. It, it pretty much is a fixture of that, <clears throat> excuse yeah. me, of that corner. Because he much. made it so. And I, I, you see in the background, there's a there's a house there. That house is just recently there, so that used to be an empty lot. So it's actually so now a little bit that right there, right? just yeah, to the right back home. And it's a little bit unfortunate. I mean, somebody obviously owns that property, but before it was completely empty, so people could see right in. Now. The, the sideline is a little bit obstructed, but you can still see it if you're driving down the, the road. Yeah. Well, and finally, just to back up a minute, um, with the Holocaust Memorial, mm -hmm. um, was there, did he speak of any kind of uh, response from the neighborhood, from the community, from the city, in terms of the, the, the political aspects of that piece? He hasn't said much. I mean, what, as far as negative, I, as far as I know, I mean, there, there could be some negative, but as far as I know, it's mostly been positive, and it's mostly been kind of a draw to people. And also, other artists have been, you know, he's friends with a bunch of other um, local artists, like folk artists, and that sort of thing that have come through and just really just that kind of grabbed their eye, and they just came over. And like I said, he works over there, so he's always there. Um, and they just ended up, you know, developing a friendship, and he's developed a lot of friendships over the years, just just through. The visual of this, you know, much less the subject matter. But fantastic, you know, James yes. Kimball. Yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> okay, um, I think that that covers all of our uh, showcases, and um, I can't thank you enough for agreeing to participate. Thanks for having me. Um, any other final comments? Go out there and see some art. Go, go check out James' stuff. It's free. It's right there on the corner. <laughs> Make sure you check out Shay's show. April 29th. 29th. 7 p.m. at 409 East Bay Street. And that's a one shot deal. One shot deal. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for watching Art Talks, Art Methods, and we look forward to seeing you next time. This program is made possible through support from Savannah Canoe and Kayak, pedal sports outfitter for the Georgia coast. Savannah Canoe and Kayak provides top quality instructions, guided tours, and camping adventures to the barrier islands of the Georgia coast. The Original Pancake House, a gourmet breakfast and lunch served with a friendly smile, where quality fresh and made from scratch still rule. Green Truck Pub. Savannah's grass-fed burger joint featuring coastal area farmers and American craft breweries. And Brighter Day, Savannah's only independent historic natural food market featuring made-from-scratch deli, vitamins and supplements, and a juice bar. Brighter Day is not a chain, but a link to the community. <laughs>